Okay, we're going to start our discussion of hypothesis testing with a little story. And it begins at a bank with a bank robber who just got away with a sizable amount of cash. Now, he was masked, so no one really knows what he looks like. But we do kind of have an idea of what his height is and that he got away in a blue Volkswagen Beetle. Now, you're the prosecutor that's assigned to this case, and so you go to the scene of the crime, and you go looking around for some evidence, and you figure you, you do have some evidence. You know the guy was about five foot ten, uh, that he got away in a blue Volkswagen Beetle, and that he was orange in color. So the police locate a suspect. He's orange, he's five foot ten, and he owns a VW Beetle. So you think, you know what? My hypothesis is that this is the guilty guilty person. So, now it's time to go to court. So, now we're in court. Here you are, the prosecutor. Here's uh, the defend defending attorney. And here's our uh, defendant and the judge. And we know that in our court system, we have an adage where we say that someone is innocent until proven guilty. So the whole reason we drag this guy into court is because we think he's guilty. However, in this courtroom, he is innocent until proven otherwise. So even though our hypothesis was that he was proven guilty, in this courtroom, the hypothesis is that he is innocent. And it is our job as the prosecutor to disprove this. And if we're able to do that, then we are able to accept our hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis, which is that he is guilty. So how do we do that? How are we going to make this proof? Well, we have to use the tools we have at our disposal, which is the evidence that we have. So our job is then to, to uh, convince the jury and the judge that if this guy is innocent, then you know this evidence that we have here? If he is innocent, then it would be very unlikely to have found this evidence. And so we did find this evidence, so that would mean that he's not innocent. So that's our job. So we said very unlikely. But what does that mean? How unlikely? So what if there's a 50% chance that this guy is innocent and yet we found this evidence uh, which seems to be condemning him? Should we call him guilty then? No, 50%? That's pretty high. That's like a coin flip. So I wouldn't want to send this innocent, an innocent guy to jail on a coin flip. All right, so what if we set it lower? What about a 20% chance of sending that guy uh, to jail if this, you know, the, the, you know, if this guy is innocent, this evidence would, would only happen 20% of the time for this guy. Well, that's saying that, you know, 80% of the time we're right, but 20% of the time we might be wrong, that he could be innocent, and we'd be sending, you know, one out of five people in this situation to jail. That's unacceptable as well. So, what number would you pick? 5%, 1%, 0.1%? So remember, this is the likelihood here of finding this evidence, which seems to be saying that this guy's guilty, but he's not. He's actually innocent. So we would, in this case, say we have a one in a thousand chance of finding evidence like this if he's innocent, meaning there's a 999 times out of a thousand he would be guilty if we found this evidence. That seems pretty good. Uh, and so this is what we need to know. We want to know what our likelihood here is, how likely this is. So why is this even important, setting this uh, significance level of finding someone guilty based on the, the likelihood of the evidence? Well, there are really four scenarios that can happen. Two of them good and two of them bad. In the first scenario, you got an innocent man. We don't know that he's innocent, but what he does, right? And the jury doesn't reject his innocent. So we set an innocent man free. All right? The second good scenario, we have a guilty man. We don't know that he's innocent or guilty on the stand, but he knows, right? And the jury rejects his innocence. So we put a guilty man behind bars. So in these scenarios, we made a correct decision. We, now let's look at the bad ones. 
So in this scenario, we have an innocent man who, unfortunately, the jury rejects his innocence. So we just made an error. We made a mistake. We put an innocent man behind bars. And the other error we could make is when we have our guilty man. Again, remember, we don't know if he's guilty, but he knows, right? And unfortunately, the jury does not reject his, his innocence. Uh, and so that means we let him free. I know it's kind of weird that I'm using this kind of double negative, doesn't reject. It'll make sense later. So the, our only choice is to either reject his innocence or to accept his innocence, to reject his innocence or to not reject his innocence. In this case, we are not rejecting his innocence, meaning we're accepting it. So we made a mistake here and we set this guy free. So in two of these cases, we got our, we got, we made the right decision. And in two of these cases, we made an error. So in this case over here, we rejected the court's initial hypothesis, the court's premise of him being innocent, right? Innocent until proven guilty. We rejected that when in actuality it was true. So this is called a type one error if you reject a true, the true court's hypothesis. And in this case, what did we do? The court's hypothesis was that he is innocent, right? That he's innocent until proven guilty, but that was wrong. So we had a false initial premise, a false, uh, what we'll later call a null hypothesis, uh, and we did not reject it. So we failed to reject a false null hypothesis. And we're going to call that a type 2 error. Now, which of these two errors do you think is worse? I guess it depends maybe on your political leanings and etc. But I think... Perhaps sending an innocent man to jail, a type 1 error, is probably worse. So we do want to avoid this, right? We want to avoid this at all costs if we can. So let's go back to our initial discussion about when we were in the courtroom over here. And so what we said here was that we wanted to disprove this courtroom hypothesis hypothesis, it's a null hypothesis, because we're going to use our evidence, right? And we said, how likely is this evidence... How likely can it be true in the face of him being innocent? And we said, well, if it happens 50% of the time uh, that he's innocent and we found that evidence, that we're not going to find him guilty. What if it's only 20% of the time that we find this uh, evidence that makes him look guilty, but he's innocent? Well, that's still kind of a lot, right? What if we pick 5% of the time that we would find this evidence that is pretty damning against this guy, and yet he's innocent? Uh, that we're getting better, right? And so this is the level we want to set. And maybe for this case, we say, I want to set it to be 0.1% of the time that we would find damning evidence. And he's innocent, right? I want it to be a rare chance, a rare occurrence where we would find an innocent man guilty, where we would find evidence, this evidence could be true in the face of his actual innocence. And so this setting these numbers is very important here. We're going to call this alpha. And this is the probability here of sending an innocent man to jail. So we want to make this as small as possible. So we would call type 1 error, we sometimes also call that alpha, alpha error. So let's go back to our four scenarios that we have again. And we say that we will call this alpha error. And so obviously, what are we going to call this one? The probability of committing a type 2 error that is failing to reject a false uh, null hypothesis, failing to reject the jury's, the court's uh, hypothesis that he's innocent when he's in, uh, in, in fact guilty, we call, we, that's beta, and so we can call this beta error. Now you might be wondering why did I go through all this talking about court cases and bank robbers and sending innocent men to jail? What does this have to do with hypothesis testing? Well, I think this analogy helps us understand some of the decisions and the, the methods we use during hypothesis testing. Remember, we are going to be in court saying someone is innocent until proven guilty. In hypothesis testing, we are going to also do this, a similar thing. We're going to prove, we're going to try start with the hy null hypothesis, which is the opposite of what we're trying to prove, right? We brought a guy we thought was guilty to court, and we're going to say he's innocent. Here, we're going to try to prove something that we think maybe a drug is going to have a particular effect. And in the hypothesis testing, we might say it has no effect. And then we try to disprove that given the evidence. And our evidence comes from the samples that we take. So hopefully all this will make sense. 
as we go through the hypothesis testing videos. All right, talk to you later. Bye.